Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Tans Haas Talk, the world's only English language program focusing primarily on Hungarian folk music. My name is Kalman Magyar Öcsi, and I'm coming to you tonight live from Toronto, Canada, the province of Ontario. Um, episodes of Tans Haas Talk, which combine a mix of music and stories delivered by yours truly, are available as always on tanshaz.com, that's T-A-N-C-H-A-Z.com, or on YouTube, just search Tanshaz Talk and subscribe so you don't miss anything. Um, today we have an episode of Tanshaz Talk Interviews. This is where I do delve into long-form interviews with a wide array of guests. Uh, episodes of uh, Tanshaz Talk Interviews are available on all popular podcast platforms, including Apple, Google, and Spotify podcast stores and all the other ones. Make sure you subscribe and leave a nice review if you like what you hear. Today, I'm very, very excited to have on the program Mark Marchik from Toronto. Let me tell you about him. Um, he has a Ukrainian background. You can tell because he's got three consonants back to back to back there in his last name. He was born in 1985 in Toronto. Boy, am I old. Um, he started playing violin when he was six years old. But you know what? He quit playing like many people do when he was around 12. He got more into sports. Namely, he was playing rugby, actually, which is interesting. Um, but he received a very good education. Uh, and imagine at this time he was not playing violin. He went to uh, uh, Montreal and received a bachelor's degree in English from McGill University. Um, after that, he did the backpacking thing. He went to Lviv, Ukraine, and he lived there for about two years. He started teaching English um, at a university, which led to other teaching gigs at other universities in Lviv. And um, in the meantime, though, he met a group of musicians and he was smitten by music again. He brushed off the violin and he started to play violin again while in Ukraine. And you know what? He said no to teaching English and he started busking full time on the streets of Lviv. And um, uh, he never looked back since. Uh, although he did come back to Toronto in 2009 to receive a MFA, a Master of Fine Arts in Writing from the University of Guelph Humber Campus. That's here in the city of Toronto. Um, and while he was uh, doing that, he, he, was, he kept playing music here and he met some like-minded musicians who he started jamming with. And the famous, world-famous Lemon Bucket Orchestra was formed in 2010. More about them shortly. Um, so though he has his MFA in writing and he's a wonderful writer and communicator, he became a full-time musician, although he did, has done some writing since then, which we'll talk about during the interview. Um, by the way, he also got into the very prestigious Master of Fine Arts program at Humber College for the jazz um, idiom, but he decided not to pursue that. He visited Kiev in January of 2014 during the protests. You remember the Ukrainian revolution, the Euromaidan protests. Uh, he had some near-death experiences there. He was right in the midst of things. But on the bright side, in a very romantic way, he met his wife-to-be, Marichka, during those protests. And she is an ethnomusicologist herself um, and an expert on Ukrainian folklore. So back to the Lemon Bucket Orchestra. That's, by the way, you can find them at lemonbucket.com. It's billed as Toronto's original guerrilla folk party punk massive. Wow, what a name. Orchestra with a K, by the way. Very, very uh, true to form. I can't not express to you guys how popular Lemon Bucket Orchestra has become over the years. In 2015, they won the World Group of the Year at the Canadian Folk Music Awards. They've been nominated not once, but twice for the Junos. That's the Canadian Grammys for those of you outside of Canada um, for the World Album, uh, World Music Album of the Year. And Mark is the ringleader of that band. He's very, very charismatic. He's very creative. And even I, people say I'm charismatic. That guy, I'm jealous of his charisma. 
Um, and um, they play all kinds of music, Balkan, Klezmer, Gypsy, Party, Punk, and of course Hungarian, which you'll actually get a chance to listen to a little later. Uh, you know, it sounds cheesy, all this various um, genres that they play in, but but and their energy is obviously amazing, but they really try to strike at the heart of all these various regions and all these various countries and these people's music. And I really love a Lemon Bucket Orchestra, and I've seen some of their live shows, and I hope you have too. And of course, uh, you can check them out on YouTube. There are six million clips of them. Um, Mark also created uh, Counting Sheep together with his wife. Uh, it's a folk opera that's uh, uh, featuring the Lemon Bucket Orchestra. It's about the Ukrainian Revolution. And they have a very, very nice duo called Balakla Blues. Um, Mark is involved in a lot of other activities in the music community in Toronto and beyond. Some examples during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, a Toronto-based online venue they cre he created called Urgent, or he worked on called Urgent, U-R-G-N-T. And he's one of the curators for Global Music Month, which is this month in September. So it's very timely that he's on to talk today. Um, that's an online festival. We'll talk about that, but uh, just so you can check it out while I'm talking here, globalmusicmonth.org. Mark is one of the curators of that. Oh, I'm getting exhausted. He's such a, such a wonderful background, but you know, you're going to ask me, nice, nice, nice background, but what the heck is he doing on a Hungarian folk music related show? Well, I'm going to tell you. I met Mark around eight or nine years ago. He was lurking, looking to learn more about Hungarian folk music. And we had coffee, I remember, outside my law office on Bloor Street. And, uh, and um, if you want to learn, come down to Chipke Camp in Detroit. And he came down that summer with a few other Lemon Bucket Orchestra members, including the dancer Stefani Abuloshin, who subsequently joined the Kodai Dance Group for a couple of years. Mark really dug his experience, and I'm really excited to have him share that with you. Um, and of course, since then, he built some Hungarian tunes into Lemon Bucket Orchestra's repertoire. And Lemon Bucket Orchestra has since toured Hungary. They've performed at Fono and Simpla Kert and other venues. And they've also toured Transylvania. And this is my first interview with someone actually located in Toronto. And I'm very, very honored and privileged that it can be with one of the central figures of Toronto's folk music community. Please... I'm very excited to welcome and help me welcome uh, Mark Marchik to the show, to Tansa's talk, calling from down the street in Toronto. Hello, Mark. Man, I, I got to get you to write my intros for me, honestly. This is, this is, that was the, that was the most in-depth, uh, like, introduction I think I've ever heard in my life, about <laughs> my life. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. And you're like the, uh, I think the, probably the third or fourth uh, interviewer or interviewee to tell me that, but it's all, all true. You know, I, I, I like to get the, the bio kind of out of the way, so to speak, so we can really focus on substance and we don't feel the need to kind of have a chronological um, you know, interview describing you. I've done that for you, so I'm very happy that you're happy with the intro. And, um, and, and welcome to the show. And let me start by saying, happy Global Music Month. Yeah, it's underway. It's underway. It started uh, September first, and my my I guess uh, collective urgent music was was involved in sort of kicking it off. We partnered up with another Eastern European festival that everybody knows and loves here in Toronto at the Ashkenaz Festival. Yeah, and uh, for this entire week we've been. Uh, We've been doing these live pop-up shows from some of the festival favorite performers that are based here in Toronto, and um, yeah, and it's continuing on until the seventh. So there's that's something for for all the listeners at home to check into. They're doing stuff every single day at four o'clock. Uh, there's a little short pop-up performance that uh, that that we produced for the Ashkenaz Festival. So there you go, Global Music yeah. Month. It's it's on. It's off to the races. And so, actually, I know you have a lot of American listeners mm -hmm. too. It's, I mean, it's some of the biggest festivals across the states are are participating in that too. From you know the Chicago World Music Festival and 
Global Kirky and Madison World Music Festival and Boston University, all these all these huge world music festivals that bring sort of the biggest acts and from all over the world to to the states and to North America are are all kind of teaming up for the first time to bring something with full access to everyone online. So in a non-pandemic year, generally these festivals would kind of combine their resources or the agents and managers would kind of get together and, and, uh, and, and save um, flight costs by bringing these big acts out and have them stay for two, three, four weeks and fly to these various festivals around this time, right? Exactly. Very like practical approach to, to bringing these acts over so that it's, you know, one festival or one community that doesn't have to shoulder the whole burden. Right. And, and Ashkenaz Festival is one of these uh, festivals. Um, Ashkenaz is a Jewish music uh, uh, festival that actually, I think Eric Stein, right? Another luminary here in Toronto. That's right. Played. Yeah. That's right. So he's the director, he's the, 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 the leader of the, um, of the uh, uh, Beyond the Pale band, which actually, I don't know if you know this, Mark, I subbed in for Brett once playing the bass um, many, many years ago. I, I don't know if Brett's still the bass player there. Or if you I'm know not him. sure if he is. They kind of have changed configurations a lot, but that, that doesn't surprise me at all. I'm pretty sure you could sub in with most, <laughs> most folk bands in Toronto. <laughs> if, the, if the money's right, Mark, you know? Uh, oh yeah, yeah, you know how it is. The yeah. ones that are playing, lo- paying lawyer prices, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so Mark, uh, the listeners have to go to globalmusicmonth.org, right? Um, and and uh, they can they can watch. Uh, I, I don't know if there's a fee associated with this, but but you can go and watch some of these acts that you'd ordinarily see at the festival. You can you can see them perform. Is that the is that the idea here? Yeah, there's no there's no fee. I mean, the way that it's structured is Global Music Month is really just a marketing tool to sort of have this one stop shop where you can see all the programming that's going on throughout the month. And so, you know, the Ashkenaz Festival will be they're streaming stuff from their platforms and Chicago World Music Festival will be streaming from their platforms and mm-hmm. uh, Urgent as well. We're going to be we're doing a Slavic music meet. Um, which is basically a kind of celebration of Eastern European music um, that is happening uh, on the 9th. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. All right, so people should check that out. Check out globalmusicmonth.org and check out Urgent, U-R-G-N-T. Is that .com or something? Let me see here. Um, yeah, dot .ca, dot .ca. Dot .ca. Oh, can- Canadian style. Um this thing, this whole pandemic, and uh, you know, who knows where we are into it or out of it or what have you, but this thing, I mean, you, what was going to be your summer had this all not happened? I was going to be uh, on the road pretty much all summer with both Lemon Bucket and Balaclava Blues, actually. Mm. It was all starting off, I, I, me and my wife, we wrote a score for um, a brand new um theater piece by the by the world renowned Belarus Free Theater. Um that is it was called Dogs of Europe based on the based on the award winning novel. It's kinda of like a you know dystopian uh European epic. And this uh we wrote the score to it. It was premiering at the Barbican in London and of and of course it was gonna be, you know, our sort of like big foray um, into writing something fresh and new that sort of wasn't wasn't something that you know we had created from our minds, but something we were sort of commissioned to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was the cap. That was the sort of starting point of then what was a a long uh, European tour with Balaclava Blues, and then Canadian and U.S. dates with Lemon Bucket. Uh, that took us pretty much until the end of the year. Oh, and that just all kind of like poof, poof, like evaporated in like in li- in a week. I mean, anybody who's in the sort of music industry um, can sort of relate to that. It wasn't a unique situation. It happened pretty much to everybody. Yeah. Um, so so mm-hmm. that happened. And, and of course, you know, 
my mind just kind of my mind and my heart tell me to keep going no matter what and yeah. so so right then I started thinking about my community and um and sort of okay, all right well what can we do how can I engage the music industry how can how can we do something that both you know keeps us inspired and hopeful but also keeps everybody else sane and what are certainly going to be really difficult times and that's what urgent came out of yeah you know the mark marchick i met uh you know nearly a decade ago was the you know young uh f free loving uh you know vagabond uh, guy <laughs> and um you know you now have a daughter right how old is she uh, I have a two and a half year old daughter, and then I also have uh, three other kids that um, that I took on um, when I married Marichka that she had from from another marriage. So do they live? They're, here? they're, do, they're do, 11 and 17, and I just moved the 24 year old to Montreal this past weekend. So these other kids live live here in Toronto too. Well, the like I said, the most the, the oldest one just moved to Montreal. Mm -hmm. So, um, but the, the other two are with us here in Toronto. Yeah. Wow. So we're not just talking about a creative impact. Um, uh, the financial impact of supporting a family is must be unbelievable right now. What you guys are experiencing in a, in a negative sense, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. It's, in, it's totally insane for sure. Yeah. It's totally insane. You know, there's obviously, you know, I, Obviously, like our government is doing, I'll say, like a much better job than a lot of other governments in the world at sort of creating at least some sort of cushion for for people who, uh, you know, who just lost their employment and have to sort of keep things afloat. But we've definitely been kind of living frugally and then trying to think forward to how this is going to how this is going to impact our lives and and whether we can or can't play music and or or in what form what f or mo it's more of a like what what role music is going to occupy in our lives yeah because yeah. it'll always be there it's just a matter of whether it's going to be the same or not right i think almost everybody understands that that it's not going to be the same well you know our guess is as good as anybody's um so you know we're not sure yet hopefully you know in a what is it uh, September so hopefully in a, a year maybe a year and a half from now you know it'll be 100% back to normal normal but it might not you know we'll be wearing masks and all that for a long time I think but you know we're just guessing right um, but I'm sure for, for you that's a, a very I mean, this has been a very very difficult thing and and um, you know instead of kind of cowering and hiding you're really, really stepping up and, and doing a lot for the community, and I really, really appreciate that. Um, well, listen, that's what we got to be doing, right? I mean, yeah. there's you can look at things and sort of get uh, depressed. And, I mean, we can all, we could spend the rest of the interview talking about all the negative ways that COVID has affected our lives. But at the same time, you know, I think one thing that it highlighted, everybody can see this, is that the normal that we had was in, was unstable in and of itself there's there were problems with the normal that we that we were already living and so in a sense this is kind of an opportunity to to look forward and restructure and rethink and reimagine and take things like from from the ground floor up like yes. i can say even on a very practical level like on the music side you know since uh since everything shut down, we obviously haven't been performing with Lemon Bucket, and even the idea of, of getting 12 people together is nearly impossible, even for a rehearsal at this point, never mind to perform somewhere in public. But what's been really interesting is that for me and Marichka, it sort of got us back to, well, let's just, let's just play together, the two of us, you know, which we really rarely had time to do just say okay let's take the accordion and the violin and let's just let's just rediscover some of the traditional music without big arrangements without big orchestrations without thinking about where just let's just play let's go back to sort of the roots 
And even as things kind of have opened up, like we now play every weekend in a, on a socially distanced patio, mm-hmm. the two of us acoustically uh, at Drum Taberna in, in Toronto. And that experience has been amazing because it's just been like, it's rather than a show, it's more like, like we, we think of them as like dates. They're kind of like musical dates right, that right. we're speaking to each other in our, in the language of our instruments and everyone else is just kind of politely eaves, eavesdropping, you know? <laughs> yes. Well, and, and by the way, you have a uh, built in babysitters, right? At, with, at, with these kids, with older kids at home. I, I do, but I, you know, I got to be careful not to take advantage of it. Um, yeah. Not, not too much because you know they they gotta figure out their lives as well and yeah. and but they're they're really great they love Maya and they spend lots of time with her and 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 when you guys have these gigs or even you were talking about this tour and sorry about drilling down into these very deep logistics but I'm curious father father of three what happens with little Maya who's two and a half years old when you guys are gonna go tour or when you guys are at the tavern uh, drum taverna playing um it's it's kind of a case by case basis like she i mean she's been on the road with it. like she's seen more of the world than i think most people have mm. in their entire lives like <laughs> in her two and a half years when, when she was two months old uh she went on tour with us uh along with our oldest daughter who has babysitter to new zealand oh. and cool. did uh, and it was actually shockingly um like easy just because you know she was in a in a crib and she, you know we she was there she came to the shows she kind of fell asleep and we did our thing and then we we hung out with her and yeah. it was just a much more kind of like family oriented type of tour than you know the days when we were kind of you know trekking through transylvania well she sounds like a great kid um and uh, and you and you know I, I did want to ask about your parents um, and and your your upbringing. Are your parents your parents are st- still with us, still around? Yeah, yeah, they're still with us. They are, you know, we're very very close. They live in Toronto, and mm-hmm. they spend a lot of time. Uh, that car- is a continuation of the answer of your previous question. Yes, they spend. A, they help us a lot with the kids and. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, and that's, I mean, they've like strong kind of supportive family values have been a big part of my upbringing the whole way through. Um, yeah. Tell, tell me where, where are, are you from that Bloor West village area, the, the traditional Ukrainian area or where were you? Yeah. Born? Yeah. Yeah. I like the first, first like duplex that, that I was born into was on high park cool. and, uh, you know, and then we moved a little bit, but we were basically like in Etobicoke, and they live in Etobicoke now mm-hmm. as well. Okay. So it was, uh, and now we live in the junction just down the street. So even after all the sort of world traveling, it all kind of like came back here. Yes, this has did. been sort of like mm-hmm. the hub for us, for our family. What was your... At least since, since the Second World War. Right. <laughs> well, you know, we... Um... We uh, we know about these Hungarian old Hungarian towns. You know, we talked to Walt Mahovlich a couple of uh, interviews ago uh, uh, about uh, the Hungarian area, the Buckeye Road in Cleveland, and we know about these uh, these these areas, York Yorkville in New York. Well, of course, for the Ukrainians, Bloor West Village, it was or was and still is the center of of it all in Toronto, at least in terms of their community. Um, so you came up in the right area. Yeah. What tell what what was your what's a traditional Ukrainian upbringing for you? You know the 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 the, the child the child of immigrants from from Ukraine. What uh, what did you do? Did you do the by the and I want to ask? Did you do the traditional Ukrainian knee breaking uh, dance classes too? <laughs> so tell me about that 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 whole upbringing uh, and and I want to see how similar it is to what the Hungarians go through. You know, I I don't know, I might be disappointing you a little bit. I didn't really have, like, although my family is like, you know, my parents speak fluent Ukrainian and we have, and we're like, you know, we celebrate according to 
to that Orthodox calendar and and all of that, like we didn't have a very sort of, I guess, forced Ukrainian upbringing. I think that was because that's what they had as as sort of second generation immigrants from their parents. Like they really grew up in all of that. But, you know, they tried to sign us up for all that stuff. But like I remember actually this is my first memory of performing ever. I was about like about six years old and I, they had signed me up for that knee breaking Ukrainian dancing. <laughs> and I remember I was I was like behind stage and I came out into the middle of the thing. I was in the middle of the pack in front and the curtains opened and I just puked all over the stage and they, and the curtains closed (laughs) and they brought me back. And I, and I remember it was so like, I didn't know what it was. Of course the show had to continue on. So they just sat me in a chair oh, God. while everybody kept doing their stuff. And I had to sit through the rest of the co- the concert covered in my own puke. Oh, my and, God. And after, and after that, of course, they, they were like, so, it's like, you know, when it came time to sign me up again, I was like, I don't think I want to do this anymore. Oh, my God. And I never went back to it. I never went back to it. Wow. You know? So, but that's... And I had, uh, yeah. it was, a th- like, for me also, I mean, I was a part of, like, a Ukrainian scouting organization. That's, like, a big thing in the Ukrainian community. But I had, I drifted away from it really quickly, the same way that I drifted away from violin at an early age. I drifted away from the Ukrainian language and culture. It was, there, it was just, you know, it wasn't something that spoke to me. Hmm. And I only realized later you know, was, I mean, there's obviously a certain element of like just wanting to fit in with my Canadian friends, whatever that means, like the sort of the general English speaking mainstream pop sort of culture, everything, everybody playing sports and right. and video games and whatever. But I realized later that it was it wasn't speaking to me because there was something in the generations of it being here at least in in our community that like that was lost Mm -hmm. and when i went back to ukraine and saw the living breathing culture both in the most traditional forms but then how it's evolving with like urban contemporary culture i started to like that really spoke to me immediately and i kind of went oh this is this is what i was thirsty for this is the this is the thing that's like inside me that I just was not in tune with in Toronto and when I was growing up. So the, the, uh, the violin playing that you did until you were 12, was that just straight up classical, like Suzuki or something? It was a, it was Suzuki method. Did you do the the Etobicoke Suzuki school? Yeah, it was with a teacher in Etobicoke. His name was Peter Farrell. Okay. And, uh, yeah, and I did that for a bunch of years. And I remember, actually, the moment that I quit was when we started doing sight reading. And uh, and I was just, I wasn't into it. As long as we were, like, listen, I just had to copy. I was, that was cool. But the second I had to be reading and plan then technique and all that stuff, it just, it right. it went... That's where that's where I went sideways. Well, that was the early mark of a guy who was not going to uh, play the traditional music and play the folk music. I mean, my sister and I also came up doing Suzuki, and uh, anybody who asks, I always say do the Suzuki method because you know it's 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 good for anybody who's got a potential proclivity to play folk music or even if not, it's the way to start the kids up. But yeah, you're right. Around you know five six years in. Uh, you you need to start reading, and I can see where that's a complete turnoff for you. You know. Yeah, and I mean, I I mean, obviously now, in retrospect, I see like how valuable that is, and um, and I would have been obviously like a completely different player had I gone through that. And a part of me is like, man, why didn't I just say, say like imagine how much better I would be, how much more fluent, how much uh, yeah. how much freer I would be to express everything, but. I mean, that wasn't my journey. That wasn't the thing that that was motivating to me. And it was 
all my other life experiences that happened, I guess, as a result of not pursuing music at an early age that made that kind of make me the musician that I am today. Right. And, and not just a musician, but I would say the, the kind of the ringleader, as, as, you, as you're called for the Lemon Bucket Orchestra, you know, that kind of ability to bring various disparate uh, peoples uh, and, and experiences together. Um, yeah, you know, somebody yeah. once told me, like, it's it's funny, I, I like, I was talking about, uh, I, I, somehow it came up, like, in a green room somewhere that I, that I had played rugby, and uh, and that I had actually, like, played at, because I played at a high level, I was playing on rep teams, and I was at a point, when I was 18, I was captain of the Canadian rugby team, mm-hmm. and... Wow. Uh, and and then and I was telling these stories and saying yeah you know, and I, I went played in the World Cup in South Africa and while we were there I sort of that that was the moment that I kind of turned around and went no this is this is not the kind of life I want I don't want to live and experience the world through uh, you know through this kind of like through tour buses I guess and behind tinted glass and all that kind of stuff and. Hmm. But I was talking about the like the whole. But what I really love, still love about the game and about sports, and they go, "Man, well, obviously you you make a band like Lemon Bucket, like." And I was like, "What do you mean?" And they're like, oh, "Look at it. It's just a rugby team with musicians." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, that, it, it is. <laughs> um, so, so, you I, know, I, there's some things that, on a subconscious level, just like make their way in there. You just can't escape who you are. You right. Know? Well, I, I can't let that one fly. I never knew this about you. So, so the c- captain of the Canadian rugby team, this is not a junior team. You're talking about the senior? It was a junior team. Yeah, ah. yeah, yeah. It was a junior, it was a junior team. And I was like, um, okay. they obviously, there's levels like, you know, from when you're 13 all the way up. And I really quickly just like, you know, built my way up. And by the time I was 18, I was captain and, Mm-hmm. And then getting into my 20s, there was that sort of point of, okay, do you move to Europe and go pro or semi-pro? Um, or do you try and play for a pro university team somewhere um, in the UK or um, or potentially down under? Like there, was, there were those kind of questions looming. Mm-hmm. Um, but after going to that, the Junior World Cup, I... It was a specific thing. It was like they took us on this on this trip like to a safari, you know, and then and then we went like on the way back, we stopped on this cliff. It was in Durban, South Africa, and it was a cliff over the biggest overlooking the biggest shanty town uh, in all of Africa. It was a million people hmm. and it was said to have the highest HIV population. Um, people living with HIV and it was, it was literally just like, just, just houses made of garbage Yeah, yeah. and so packed. And I remember we're there and they didn't let us get out of the bus. So we're sitting and we're all in our like, you know, team Canada polo shirts and khaki pants or coming from one rehearsal going to a next rehearsal or not rehearsal one, one, uh, (laughs) practice, (laughs) see practice. Yeah. One practice to another. And like, and everybody's sort of like trying to take pictures through this tinted glass. And I was, I was there and I just had this moment of, of the, yeah, I, this is not the way, you know, Mm. I just wanted to go and see and feel and talk and understand if I'm going to walk this earth and it's going to take me to these incredible places, then, you know, I, I want to, I want to go and actually be there. Mm. Um, and that's the thing that that's the major thing that you know really differentiates, I think, uh, sport from music is with especially folk music is that music is so collaborative in nature, you know. Mm-hmm. And even if you're performing, you know, there's there's that part of getting together and playing together, of finding communities, playing with kids or playing with. Um, you know, just fans or other musicians. And it's, there's something that I really, you know, I love about that because then you not only are experiencing a place through music, but then of course we're all human beings. So at some point you put down the instrument and you start talking and you start walking and you see how people, um, you get a chance to just 
to live and to, to be with people and, and experience the world. That's the moment, the, 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 the intimacy the, uh, like that a Tansas a musician gets, that, that intimate moment with a dancer or with a colleague on stage. And forget stage, I hate stage, you know, uh, on the floor. You know, that, that's the moment that you live for. And I think as a musician, and I think, you know, 98% of the time it's not there. But what you do it, you keep driving, you keep doing it, you keep playing, you keep performing, you keep traveling for that 2%, which nobody can really yeah. understand. That, that's what you're going for. Sorry to be, I hope kids are not listening, but that's the orgasmic moment that, that I think we all kind of strive for, as, at least as, as folk musicians. Um, and I can see where, you know, you kind of don't see that on, um, on, you know, as a, as a performer when it comes to you being on the soccer pitch or on the football field or rugby field, whatever, right? Yeah, and I mean, like, it's there in, in a smaller percentage. I just, you know, I found that it's, it's more of, rather than it being like a side effect of sport, it's it's an actual goal in music, you know. So mm -hmm. so that's something, and especially in folk music. I mean, you you nailed it. Like it's all of the Tanzhouse house experiences that I've had have been exactly that, which is why I was so uh, like I was so moved when I came down to Tsipke and had my first you know like Tanzhouse house experience. And it wasn't only about the music. Like I could talk about. I could talk about, you know, meeting Levant and, and like how he, the technical parts of how he, you know, to ask me to hold the violin that changed the way that I played forever or about playing songs with you from recordings that you sent to me weeks ago that I was just dying to learn, just like doing it in a drunken midnight session at, or, you know, the musical parts. But the thing that really struck me the most of that, that camp and that Tanz house was that it was such a fully inclusive intergenerational thing. Mm -hmm. It wasn't about, it wasn't a scene, you know, like if you think about like the indie music scene or the EDM scene where there's a certain way that you look, there's a certain way that you talk, there's a certain attitude that you have to have to be accepted within that community. What I felt there was like everyone from, you know, the four-year-old kid to the 90-year-old grandparents were participating in this incredible experience, whether it was music or dance or sport or playing soccer or doing a, you know, wet and wild, like, you know, kind of like fun, just getting, yeah. getting through the heat in the summer. It was just this full kind of intergenerational thing that, and I, as somebody who wasn't Hungarian, to come into there and to just feel completely at home was, was so inspiring and liberating. So you, you kind of missed that from the Ukrainian community. Had you kind of stuck with it, I'm sure you might have experienced that. But I am going to say, of course, that as a hung, proud Hungarian, uh, that we have this Tanzhaz movement, which, is, which makes what we do very unique. Is there a Ukrainian version of Tanzhaz? Or put another way, how do you guys party to your folk music? Listen, it's it's you know what it's not the same, and I and I say this obviously with all respect to myself and my own culture. But one of the big one of my big takeaways from experiencing, um, you know, the Tons House, let's say, movement or the Tons House culture, was that I rem I remember clearly being like, I wish we had this in the Ukrainian community. Because there are there uh, there is a community in every sort of let's say if we're focusing on like Eastern European communities, every every country has their own community. They each have their folk music, and they each have different ways of celebrating that or you know partying to it or whatever. But the thing is that with Ukrainian folk music, there's there's a 
there's an element there uh, that is not uh, tied to the music at all that hinders hugely, and that was Soviet presence, mm. right? right? So, so there was you know literally execution of folk musicians throughout the history mm. that stopped that kind of proliferation, and that continued on into well beyond the fall of uh, you know of the wall of fall of communism. There's, there's, it didn't happen on that sort of level where it's like, you know, you play, you die, but there was this kind of like a russification and a popification of the culture that didn't allow for, um, the folk traditions to grow, uh, in the same way that they did in the Hungarian community in the same way that I see there, there isn't like a phono house in Ukraine that is so extensive in documenting all the various regions, but then not only that, but in creating a space for it to live and be passed on to generations. There are definitely small groups that are interested in it. We have our folk dances, you know some of them, you know some of the music, but they're not things that a bit like that most people know or are interested by and they're not sort of staples of our cultural gatherings whether they're here or there they're more of a uh, how would I put it like they're more of like a kind of extra thing there's a little there's a little sense of pride when it happens but it's not like a necessity for Ukrainian party right right Um, you know so it's too it's too bad really and it's something that you know, both with Lemon Bucket and now with my wife, with Marichka, and in various ways, like, you know, we've been working really hard to kind of bring into our communities. So Marichka is is an ethnomusicologist. She has, uh, like, maybe you can talk about her experience, but, you know, my understanding is she has gone to villages in Ukraine and and she has collected songs from the older generation are there still trees to shake and things to explore? And is it maybe not too late yet to salvage this thing, um, salvage the real roots music of Ukraine like the Hungarians did starting in the early 70s? Yeah, absolutely. And and I'll say that, you know, it's, I mean, there's, I, I'm, I hope there's no... Ukrainians, you know, listening right now are like, what are you talking about? There's so many examples of this and and there are amazing, you know, musicians that keep the tradition alive. And so I, I, I'm going to say, yes, that does happen, but on a different, just on a different level than it happens in the Hungarian community for sure or in the Serbian community. Um, but yes, there's definitely... Um, a lot of trees to shake. There's amazing projects that have emerged in sort of, let's say, the last 10 years. Uh, and currently, right now, Marichka is working on one. Um, you know, her, her story is like she, she was a classical pianist and then uh, she had an injury that, you know, prevented her from continuing al- along that path, but she was already at the conservatory. And they would just switched her into the folklore, um, mm. the folklore faculty, and she started to do this um, ethnomusicological research. Um, and then a, a group of her classmates they started to, you know, create their own performance ensemble and go into villages in eastern Ukraine, gathering their their repertoire. Um, and they formed what is now Bozici, um, who's like the, I guess, preeminent, um, you know, Ukrainian polyphony group out there. Uh, and they do a lot of, they do a lot of sort of this ethnomusicological research. But the thing is, is that most groups, there are a bunch of them that do it. Everybody holds on to their material very closely. Um, and there's a whole bunch of reasons for that. Um, but without getting too much into that, it's been very, everything is sort of very, very localized and, um, and very hard to access. And so one of these sort of amazing silver linings of COVID is that 
Marichka went, you know, I've been thinking about putting together this folk music archive and, uh, and I always thought that it was going to be, you know, like when I retired, once I was done with performing, but right now there's a kind of pseudo retirement that's (laughs) happening. I might as well do it now. And she started working on, on creating this virtual, um, this virtual archive of Ukrainian polyphony that is an incredible, like she's, I've been sort of watching her as she's been collecting and she's managed to at this time, and maybe it's because it's this time that things are working, but she's managed to start to pull together uh, photos, recordings, um, different types of archival material from every sing- every region of Ukraine. Um, mm. And the, her pl- she teamed up with... Uh, folklore center here in uh, or a historical research center here in Toronto at the St. Vladimir Institute and she's now like fully working on this archive that's going to launch uh, at some point uh, in March of next year. Polyphony is is not just like a melody and with harmony on top it's actually almost like counterpoint like it's a standalone the second melody that you hear or the third or fourth on top of that is a standalone melody that, that's different than just harmony of the main line? Yeah, I mean, I, when you talk to, like, to, to people with, like, classical training, that's sort of their sort of main uh, reference point for polyphony is counterpoint. Um, or this, or, like, the few, uh, what do they call it, counterfugal music or whatever. But right. um, polyphony just... It just means multi voices. Okay. So it's just any any multi part par, harmony uh, harmony singing essentially. Mm-hmm. And in Ukrainian music, it's like there's a lot of different. Sometimes it can be dissonant. Sometimes there are counter melodies. Sometimes it's just it's a drone voice and a melody on top. Sometimes it's unison. There's there's so much. There's such a variety um, that varies from region that varies depending on how old the song is and what Marichka's tracking is like a big you know obviously Ukraine is the biggest country in Europe mm-hmm. landmass wise um, was sort of at the crossroads of so many different cultures and then on top of that um, we're, we're going she's going back like over a thousand years where is she getting the source material from? It's a combination of uh, her own source material that she got when she was doing her studies and um, other ethnomusicologists who have all these this material that they've just been sitting on for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, in some cases, she's teamed up with um, with like archives in various regions. Some regions are still holding on and not giving their material, and others are. Um, so it's a, it's a combination. It's a, it's kind of a slow process. I have a feeling and she does too, that this is even this first step is really, is exactly just a first step. Like it's gonna, it's gonna end up being, you know, whether it's her taking it on or another team of people, it's going to be a sort of big project Yes, well, that takes many, many years. As you guys Mm -hmm. know, with the whole, the project that happened at Fono House. Well, Fono and then the Hoyo Manio Kazan and the List Academy, and, uh, and you know, we've already interviewed two ethnomusicologists here, one from Hungary, uh, Shoma Shalomon, and the other one from Minnesota, Colleen Birch, and they're both doing extraordinary work, new work. Uh, there's always something new. Um, I, I want to ask one more nerdy question about your cheap get. Uh, I think it was 2012 when you were there. That does sound right, about right to you. That's when Gaja Band was there. That's exactly, yeah, it was them who were there, so it was 2012. Right, so 2012, and Gaja Band was there, and you mentioned Levente, Levente Seike, of course, the former uh, ambassador um, and musician, uh, and uh, we, we, I interviewed him a couple of episodes ago, so he, you, I wrote down here that he said something to you about your violin position, and forgive the, forgive the listeners, please, if we get really nerdy and technical for a second, but what did he, <laughs> what did he tell you, and how did it change your playing? A uh, couple things. Number one was no chin rest, or no shoulder rest, rather. 
That's right. Um, so up in that point, up until that point, I was playing with a shoulder rest. And of course, like I was watching a lot of videos of violin players and I was noticing how so many, uh, specifically like, um, Romanian and Serbian players were not using it. And I was kind of like, I just, I was, I couldn't do it. Like I, cause I was, you know, I just, I couldn't figure out how to do it. And because I felt like it, it was always going to fall. And, but he was like, well, you know, I mean, you don't, you can obviously, you can use it or you don't have to, but the thing is, is that you have to find a way that you're not clutching your violin. You know, you're not holding it. It has to be sort of sitting there and your fingers just kind of float atop the strings as opposed to you holding the violin and then trying to move your fingers. Because you're never going to get them to be, you're never going to get them to move around. And so, the, the first thing was let's get rid of your let's get rid of your uh, shoulder rest, and the second one was let the violin fit in the in the sort of U of your hand as opposed to on your thumb, hmm. um, as a very basic. And that was another sort of you know standard kind of, especially Eastern European, but really a lo- most folk violin players sort of have that at least when you're in first position. Mm-hmm. Um, and that changes, of course, as you like, as you start to evolve and you need to move up the neck. But, um, but just as a, like a base position, it was like get comfortable, let the violin just sit there, and and then and then everything else, like you're just you're working on your finger strength. Um, that those were the two main things, um, and then the third one was was just to work on bowing like just to do long, long bows, because that's just thinking of the bow as your breath. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so those were kind of three, those are some things that were, they're very simple. And it's kind of like, you know, anybody who plays violin is like, well, yeah, that's obviously it's intrinsic. We, we know those things, but, but at that moment in my life when it was, you know, I was just playing for a couple of years, I was just getting into Um, you know, starting to, starting to evolve as a violin player and starting to understand the kind of sound and the kind of style that I was interested in pursuing. And, and I remember him saying to me like, well, you have a shoulder rest and you're the, the neck sits on your thumb. If you're going to look like a classical player, how are you going to sound like a, like a folk player? Mm, Right. So you just gotta, you know, like think about you're going to sound how you, how you, you, it's one of those, like, you are what you eat. Right. Kind of things, kind of analogies, you know? You know, he was messing with you, right? He uses a shoulder. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, 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 for that's sure. That's a, that's and a joke. Course, like, that's the other thing that lets you realize when it's kind of like when you're learning from anybody, and I've realized this over the years because I had so many amazing mentors, is that, like, for every rule, there's that that somebody tells you there's there's a counter rule right right you know yeah exactly i'm just gonna say that's a that's a that's an inside joke we tell all the uh the goyim you know the non-hungarians to uh not use yep. a shoulder pad but we in secret we use a shoulder pad i'm just kidding <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> for sure <laughs> um well, that's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy you came down to that camp. I remember a very, there was a legendary night around the campfire when you guys did your lemon, little lemon bucket show, and uh, it was just so fun. And, and I know there's the three of you there, you and Tanji at the time, and, uh, and, and Stefania, yeah. who really got into the dancing. She's a wonderful dancer, and she's still with the band. Um, so uh, that was a really fun week. I don't know if you were there the whole week or just three or four days, but, but, um, but that was so fun. Um, so you're still there, right? Okay. Yeah, I hear you. Great. I hear you, man. I'm just like I'm reminiscing right now. Yeah. I'm kind of remember. I remember we were there. Like we were there the whole week, and at the end of it, we nice. didn't want to leave. Yeah. And then a f- funny story on the way back. I don't know if I ever told you this, but like I had, <laughs> I had like I I I remember that I was like. I, there was something like I had a, an old violin that I like took the pegs out of and and I had it in them in like a Ziploc bag and I was like oh I want to make I need to keep these pegs because like 
I want to make a necklace out of them or something like that or some stupid like hippie thing. <laughs> and I and then I also had an old piece of rosin there, right? And mm-hmm. so I had this thing in my pocket and then somehow like the last night I it like the rosin just shat like somebody stepped on it and the rosin shattered and just it was just like a it was fully white, right? And I and I'm we go we're coming back to Toronto and and we get pulled over at the border. Of course you do. Yeah, we get pulled over and of course Tongi is for anybody who doesn't know, he's like he has this huge beard and mane, like he looks like a lion. He wears heart sunglasses. He was just he was still hung over from the last night, from the night before, passed out in the back seat. I was driving and I had at the time like a big like red mohawk. You know? Yeah. So obviously yeah. obviously they're gonna stop us. You've been you've been <laughs> randomly they, randomly selected for a screening. You yeah, been, yeah <laughs> ra- very random. Very random. Yeah. So they, they pull us over and like open the door and uh, step out and like eat this bag this bag with the crushed rosin and these like <laughs> violin pegs and tailpiece. Yeah that are just covered in white powder. They, like, she she pulls this thing out, and I just remember, like, I was like, what the fuck yeah, exactly. am I going to say, yeah, you know? Like, yeah, yeah. But luckily, of course, like, the dogs were there, and there was, not, you know, nobody was barking. It was not, and she just, like, looked at it and yeah. was like, what is this? And I was just sweating, tongue-tied, didn't know what to say, but... Obviously, told her the whole thing, and then I took out the violin and mm. ended up. I was like, I can play for, it. and I ended up playing a song no. that I had learned because I was like, <laughs> I just I have to play to like prove to her that I'm actually a violin player, and these things are not a pipe. You oh know? my god, yeah, and, and this is my crack pipe and my bowl here, yeah. <laughs> wow, I didn't know that story. That's great. <laughs> yeah, man. So that yeah. was it. Was That's it great. was a great. Well, well you know, um, a- after that, of course, and I, you know, I've seen you off and on after that. Not too much, but I remember going to um, the, right here at the Kingsway Festival. This is right above my office, actually, here, mm-hmm. uh, a block and a half away. You guys were playing uh, a couple of years ago, and. Um, and you saw me, and I think you, you might have changed the set list immediately on stage, and you guys decided yeah. to play Urke, uh, some gypsy tunes. I, I wanted to play a very short selection uh, from that. I don't want the copyright police to, to, to shut the show down on the YouTube or podcast, but I'll play just a little end of the, the Urke. This is what uh, the, uh, you know, the gypsy music from Transylvania sounds like uh, when the Lemon Bucket Orchestra plays. And then obviously we're going to talk about the Lemon Bucket. Hold on here. Traditional ending there. Wow. So that's pretty. That's a nice big sound, Mark. Uh, I, I hear your violin. I hear like a, is that a is that the tuba or is, or sousaphone or whatever? Oh yeah, yeah. There's. I mean, I think on that recording we had something like sixteen people. Yeah. So we had a whole brass section, a couple of violins, right. um, a sopilka, which is like a, like a flute. Like yeah. I forget what it's called in Hungarian. It's a like furuja, a furuja, furuja, yeah. furuja, yeah, 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 yeah. And then the drums and and uh, yeah, it's a uh, it, it's really it's really a, a a fun different sound. And um, again, you know, saying it's like a crossover band is 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 one thing, but and it's anybody who's listening carefully here, uh, hopefully can appreciate that Mark, who's kind of the key principal finder or founder and the ringleader. I know you're not alone here, Mark, on this, but but you know um, you, you're you're really into the you you really try to get into and understand um, the the various parts 
uh, which on uh, the countries and the regions, and you you really do your best, even though it's really really hard to play music going from Poland all the way down to Turkey, you know, and and uh, etc. Et and I experienced some of that in the Tamburitsins, you know, those challenges of trying to learn it properly, but. But um, but you do that, and and um, you could equally be on a Serbian or on a Bulgarian or on a Romanian podcast and have similar conversations about your experiences. You know? Well, it's about I mean you know because you play so many different types of music too. I I think it's it comes down to like the intention and and respect and you know and then to a certain degree like confidence and ambition. Um, you know, I've, I've always, maybe this comes from sports too, but I always like enjoyed the challenge of coming in and like learning, learning something new and, and always knowing that you're like always short yeah. and keep pushing it. Like even listening to that recording, I was like, oh man, that like so much that I like, we learned about about sort of a feel and style and even fingering and bowing after that recording which is one of the amazing things like again about about folk music is that you never stop learning like you you never do and that's that's why i think you know people often have said like oh why don't you guys just write your own tunes and then like and do something more poppy which like we can do but it was never i mean that wasn't the intention the intention is to was to like to discover the world through music and to be a part of something that's bigger than ourselves, yeah. you know? So that, that was always the thing. And so whenever we came to any type of music and obviously Hungarian music is not any different, it was like, okay, let's like, let's dig into this and not only let's dig into it and listen to the recordings and listen to multiple recordings. And you remember like how hungry I was, from you saying like give me everything you got i need to listen to all of it Mm -hmm. and then and then on top of that saying well that's not enough we got to go to hungary and we can't go once we got to go several times and we got to play with people there and see what it and we got to eat the food and walk the walk and and drink the drink and see like what's what this whole thing is about you know so the band was formed in 2010 um, it, I think it currently has around 12 members, but I know it's gotten up to like 17 at any point in time. Yeah. Different nationalities. Had, like, yeah. There's a, there's like a, jo- there's like a running joke that like you haven't, like you're not a Toronto musician until you've passed through the lemon bucket. <laughs> well, when I see you guys on stage or I see you in the middle of a crazy dance floor, I look at some videos of you. I often think like, oh, that would be so fun, man, just to be there and spend that time. And then, and then, then I like kind of reflect, and I go, "Nah, it sounds really messy," you know, like. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, that's like that. It is totally messy, and you know, it's funny. Like, at any given point in your life, I mean, we. That's why we've had so many musicians that have come through because, you know, at some points they're totally normally we've had guys that are like with us for three or four years or five years, and they're like, you know, I'm ready for something else in my life. You know, because there's not like there's a, it's a very specific type of thing. And, um, you know, there's for some people, for example, like like you want to get even more deep into the tradition. And there is a peak of where we hit it because, you know, a, a big part of what we're doing also is playing it loud, playing it funky, playing it in a way that we can sort of, you know, that has a specific kind of vulgarity to it. Mm -hmm. Um, that is like, that is appealing for like a young party audience. So, you know, there's, there's definitely, um, it's definitely not for everyone. And, and that's the, I think that's a sort of one of the great things about it too, is that it can evolve and people can evolve. And we never were like, Oh man, like we lost Axel Rose, the band's done. You know, that's just, <laughs> you know, but you just, you yeah. keep playing because the, the music is alive and it was, it was alive and for dozens of years and sometimes centuries before us and it's going to continue to live for centuries after us. 
I have around 372 questions to ask you about the Lemon Bucket Orchestra and the logistics. <laughs> I'm going to ask only a few of them, but I want people to understand this. Yes, there are orchestras with 87 people in them playing Shostakovich or whatever. Okay. There are also big bands you go to see. And there are 24 people and the saxophonists all stand up at the same time to solo. And they sit down. The trumpet guy comes. And it's amazing to watch. Guess what's happening? They all have sheet music in front of them. Okay? In Lemon Bucket Orchestra, the only sheet music you'll see is someone blowing their nose, maybe. Or, you know, so, like, no one's using sheet music. And it's all happening right there on the spot as well. And there's... It's set, but it's also improvisative. So we're talking about, I have hard enough time sometimes getting three or four people to row in one direction. We're talking here about a dozen to a dozen and a half of people. Um, you're talking about a bit of a revolving door. I get that. With that many people, that's always going to happen. But, you know, auditions. Uh, or, and then people have to learn the material. And then, God forbid, you want to do something new. How the hell do you rehearse that? So let, let's talk about crazy. that part. Yeah. It's pretty crazy. Like you, you know, you set it. We also, we don't do set lists ever. We, I think there's, there's like I could count on my, on one hand, the number of times that we had to do a set list. And use, usually it was because it was like something televised where like they needed to have it for like licensing issues or whatever right. but it was we never do it and it's the same for the reason that you mentioned like at that festival kingsway like if i see you in the audience i want to be able to play something where i can connect to you yeah. you know right. or if somebody calls out that thing and it you know whatever it is or I, it feels like it's a slower night or a faster night or whatever it is, I want to be able to do those things. So that's the crazy part, and and why, you know, there we do have a we've had a lot of musicians come through. But that said, like we don't have people come through for like a few gigs. Like we don't, we're not a sub band. Like right. none of our musicians have sub players. Mm -hmm. If they can't make it, they can't make it. That's mm -hmm. it. We either don't do the gig, or we do the gig without them. Mm -hmm. Because it's like the the repertoire is is like, you know, five or six hours worth of music that it could be anything at any given point. Now, of course, there's times like you know you go on tour and you kind of like you have your set ones and there's certain songs you play every single night. Um, but you know there are there are those like weird ones that like you 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 maybe maybe we'll just pull it out or I'll, I'll tell the audience like hey if you guys if you actually want to hear something and you know any tunes scream them out and then they'll scream out something we haven't played in like three or four years mm. and we got to do it because you know they called us on it and it's a challenge and it's fun and you know that's how we do it but rehearsing wise and new songs like the, the process of writing um or arranging new music is it's, it's pretty fluid. It happens in a different way every time, you know? Sometimes it's, well, just, it'll be an old recording, and, um, sorry, it'll be an old recording, and we'll, like, you know, we'll bring it in, we'll learn that, and then somebody else will have an association with another song, and we'll do it, or we'll rip a different chord progression and put it on that, or we'll, like, try it with, like, a hip-hop beat, and then we'll try it with like a cho we'll switch different melodies and different harmonies in it and and um often like it'll take you know it, it can be anywhere from a song can sit with us for like a year before it actually finds that thing that like we go okay yeah now it's good let's let's bring it in or sometimes there are songs that like by the end of the rehearsal it's done and we're playing it the next show you know? On, at non-COVID day at times, do you have a set rehearsal day? Yeah, every Tuesday. Every Tuesday. Every Tuesday since the beginning. It's always like that was. That's actually one of the things that uh, has really kept us going. Has been like, uh, you know, right from the beginning, I chose a day that nobody's doing anything, mm -hmm. and went and went. This is going to be our rehearsal day, and that's always you know whether we have gigs or not 
this is when we get together to play music. Um, Mm -hmm. And we were like young and sort of free enough that that was, that was a thing that like pretty much everyone committed to. Mm -hmm. So it was like, you know, there was always, I never sort of understand. I had a lot of friends that have different bands and they would get together for like a rehearsal before they had a gig. And I never sort of got that, you know, like, how are you, how are you supposed to sound good if you're not just playing together and speaking together and, getting to know each other you know it's kind of yeah. like i don't know in a certain way it's kind of like dating you know you get to know as you as you like get into it you get to know people better and sort of things things either get better or worse but they get like they get deeper yeah. regardless <laughs> I, I i get that and i i, I wish uh, with my band we live closer to practice but you know levy's in montreal Nautilus in st catherine's and i'm in toronto and the uh, just in Montreal. Yeah, yeah, but you guys um, have also been like, you yeah. guys have been like together for what? How many? Like, well, you guys are essentially yeah. family. Yeah. So it's also a different, you yeah. know, you have a bit of that longevity that's kind of built in. Your um, your challenge also you know? is, I'm, I mean, just a list of musicians, and I know, I know some of them. I mean, like, first of all, there's this, there's this at the lemon bucket. There's like a total disparate level among each other or with respect to each other in terms of your education musical education right? oh yeah for sure and and background uh musical background you have some you know people with master's degrees in music and some people who kind of just learned off on the street busking or whatnot you know um and then you have like nationalities like different nationalities um yep. what, what are some of the nationalities of the folks currently playing with you guys um Let's see. Oscar is from uh, Mexico. He's. Uh, we have Josh. His background is Guyanese. Um, Nathan is Dutch. Um, Stefania is Ukrainian. So is Alex. Um, and so am I and Marichka. Right. Um, I'm looking at the list. Have? There's a... Naoki. Yeah. Naoki is from Japan. <laughs> Um, Michael, then, how about Michael? Michael is, I mean, he is, uh, he's Ukrainian and Canadian. I mean, like he's been in Canada for so many years, but he's back. He's got, he's got, uh, he's got some Ukrainian background. Oh, does he? Well. My, Michael Lewis Johnson. He sounds like, a, he sounds like an Olympian. Not, uh, like, I know, right? Yeah. I know now running the 200, like, 200 meter hurdle, Michael Lewis Johnson. <laughs> yeah, because it's like they're can. I mean, he's like he's Canadian as they come, but his mom is Ukraine has like Got is it. like half Ukrainian, and so he keeps saying like I'm one hundred, and then he says he says something like I'm like one six hundred and forty seventh Jewish, or <laughs> something. I don't know. He is a hell of a player, I'll tell you, man. Can... Every you know everyone like I everyone is so great in such different ways and we keep learning so much from each other like yeah. you know when I I, I I I was telling you this before like when I when we started Lemon Bucket you know I could barely hold the violin properly and I and I didn't know any theory whatsoever and I remember our first few rehearsals you know, I was just like playing the melody. I, it was actually, it was probably Kalushari. And, and I was like, this is a song. And then everyone was just playing it, you know, just an A, a chord the whole way through. And then like would go to the five. And I was like, no, that's not it. There's other chords in there. I don't know what they are. <laughs> oh, yes. But they're there. Like the way they play it is just different. <laughs> and I thought, and I didn't like, I learned it from, um, from like a ukrainian violin player so i didn't have any recordings i didn't know what it was called Mm -hmm. and so we were just trying to figure it out and then eventually i found it and then started to go through all these recordings and then we started picking apart what could possibly like all different options and i remember like my the, the guys that were playing with us like they're like master's degree musicians and they're like what the what is going on what are they using like what is this and yeah but they were so i mean they were it was amazing not thinking back on it it's amazing that they that they gave like 
you know, guys like me the time of day. But, you know, when I talked to them both back then and now, it was, uh, you know, they recognized something both in the music and in the spirit of what that core group of us had and what we wanted to do that they were just, they weren't getting from their schooling, they weren't getting from other bands. There was a real genuine, like, this is music happening now. Yeah. And it didn't matter that they had to go through so with the fine tooth comb just to figure out what the chords were because, you know, it was it was so worth it once we actually got to play together. <laughs> right. uh, what were your impressions about traveling in in Hungary and in Transylvania? Also, t tell me where you where you know generally where you guys went to and what was your impression of. Of, of the way the Hungarians there kind of accepted and, and responded to your music? It was cool. I mean, we were, we kind of went everywhere. Um, I couldn't even, I couldn't even like, I don't remember all of the the names of the towns. They had a lot of consonants, that's for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, as well. And <laughs> I, we we were mostly, I think, like we were mostly in the eastern part of, what? of the country because our... Of which country? Our, of, sorry, of, of Hungary? Of Hungary. Okay. Yeah, because we were in the east of Hungary and the west of Romania mm -hmm. um, and a bit of like the north of Serbia. Mm -hmm. um, that was sort of like where most of our, our, of our touring was. Um, and it was, it was, I mean, it all started from the International Romani Arts Festival in Timisoara. Okay. Um, and we just, we met with this, um, this is the guy who started it, who, you know, he had this sort of mission of sort of bringing, um, bringing Roma music and culture to, to be sort of more respected within Romania. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, as you know, there's like so many problems with, kind of this inherent, I guess, racism that, mm -hmm. and a whole bunch of other different issues. But so he wanted to do this through music. And so he made this International Romani Arts Festival. And when he came across our band, he was like, listen, you got, this is like, this is exactly what I think could really serve the purpose well, because you guys are Canadians and you're not you're Canadians, you're young punks, but you're playing this traditional music and like the, a lot of Roma music mm -hmm. and you're, you have a respect for the culture. Like, why do, what if we team you up with some Roma bands here and we can do some shows across the country and they like sent us around the country. Cool. And then he hooked us up with a Hungarian uh, promoter and we started to do shows in, in Hungary as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so we really got to see like the whole, we went through like Transylvania and then into, um, and then into Hungary and it was super, just super amazing. It and, was super great. And, and, and the, the, uh, the, the crowd, was it very much different? I mean, this is not, this was not your, you know, your core, you know, real call to fan base. I'll just, I, I'd say what you guys have at least here in Toronto is, is this, was there a uh, was it kind of different? Was it more they they sat and listened, and or did you sense a, a really keen appreciation for the notes and the styling of the audience there? It was, you know, what it's re it was different in both places. Like it was different in Hungary than it was in Romania. And this obviously, like any musician knows, that a lot of it, it all depends on who your promoter is or who your booker is, mm -hmm. because you can. And especially with Lemon Bucket, like you could put us in a soft seater venue and we'll play a set that will cater to that audience. And or you can put us in a in like a basement club where DJs are playing all night and we can cater to that audience and it'll be a different thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, with both places we had like in in Romania, it was like it was a university crowd. It was all students, and so every city we went to, it was like, it was a party. It was like a cool. huge party. We played as loud as fast with, like, 
as crazy as we could. And it was, you know, those kind of nights that went, that got full of Rakia and Palinka and, and went very late and got sloppy and were, you know, super fun. In Hungary, they were more like festivals and clubs where people listened more. Mm -hmm. And so that was really interesting um, just to have that, like those two different types of um, those two different types of experiences. Um, And it was I mean, they they just they felt like in Romania, there was the feeling of like, what the hell? Like, how did you get into this? How are you playing this? Right. And like, how is somebody from over there so into what what we are? Yeah. You know what I mean? There right. was this thing which, like, I actually felt really proud of to yes. get to have this feeling of of people back there who generally like the audiences are like listening to American music. Yeah. You know, and they're and they're going, but wait, but these guys who look and talk like us Mm -hmm. like in terms of like age and you know kind of punkiness and everything but they're playing our music and and they're making it sound awesome Mm. you know they're made they're speaking to us and in a way that we haven't felt i and i felt really good about sort of giving that life to the culture with with hungary it was a bit different it felt more like it felt more of um there was more of a thing of like, yes, thank, like, it was more of an appreciation of like, thank you, you're part of something that's, that's, there was already that appreciation for kind of folk music. Right. You know, in a way that I don't feel, it's a different type of, it's so much more developed in Hungary yes. than it is in Romania. Absolutely. You know, so, so there was... You know, like you go to, to, to Fono and like, there's just, there's all these, everybody is a musician, you know what I mean? Or a dancer and everybody has, there isn't this like, wow, you're giving us something that we've never heard before and we're completely wowed. It's more of like, yes, thank you for being a part for coming into our folds kind of thing. Right. And that's, I think the, uh, the impact of the Tansas movement, that's very much more, more developed in Hungary than anywhere else in the world, you know, that, that connection and that knowledge, that innate knowledge of, of folk music, you know. Um, Mark, have you ever misread a room? Uh, <laughs> you know, you talk about, you know, these people are soft question people, sit and listen. These people are the used to the DJs, so we're going to go to Oompa Oompa the whole night. <laughs> like, you know, and I, I, I sometimes massively screw up reading the room, you know, especially for like when I play these, You'd call them zabavas, you know, but I call them like balls or din- yeah, yeah. dinner dances. Yeah. With my with that kind of band that I play with, you know, I'm I'm like they need slow music. All right, let's play slow music. Not not working. <laughs> let's speed it up. Let's go medium. Let's go Latin. Let's go waltz. Let's go polka. Let's go charda. Let's go to sleep because this place sucks. You know, like like how do yeah, you yeah. like yeah. like do you ever massively screw it up and then do you sometimes look around and ask for help from your bandmates? Because that's what I do. Man, I. <laughs> I, I screwed up for sure. I mean, that's part of the thing. And if, if you don't have a set list, like that's, you're bound to screw up, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I think part of it is like, I, you know, I definitely, I'll answer first saying, like, I definitely look to my bandmates. There's this like, there's this, I forget who it was, um, but I recently saw this, like rewatched this documentary on Miles Davis. And, uh, I know it's faux pas to bring in jazz into a folk conversation, but but okay. <laughs> I remember this one player being like, this one player saying why Miles was amazing is because, you know, this this one piano player was playing and then he played a wrong chord and he was like, ah, oh, you know, like, oh my God, I just like, he thought Miles was going to like turn around and just like, Mm. Bitch just slap him. <laughs> give it to him like yeah. like most band leaders in the 50s would do yeah. but he but instead miles just played the note that made his chord right oh. you know mm. and then and so a lot so i do definitely like it's not the same because we're not playing jazz like we have sort of arrangements of tunes and stuff so it's less about 
wrong notes, but there could be a wrong read in terms of set list and stuff. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I will look back and, and like, be like, guys, how do we get this back on track? And somebody start a different tune or somebody give me something that's going to help us to get back, you know, in the right plan. And, and they'll make the suggestion that'll make that right again, right. that'll make it build. Cause any set list is, is the story. You know, you can't go a hundred miles an hour the whole way through or, or like, you know, if you want to go or rather you can do that if you want, but it's just depends on what story you want to tell. Right. So anything that might seem like the wrong song, you can obviously, you can pick that up and rectify it. Mm -hmm. That said, like, of course we mess up all the time or like human beings. And yeah. That's just that's just kind of, that's just a, a kind of a part of it. And in fact, sometimes I mess it up on purpose <laughs> because you're like, pissed. there's definitely, I've had those moments when, like you, like coming into a Zabava where I'm just like, I know from the second I walk in there that I'm not going to like this gig. Right. So, and I know, or, or, you know, or for, unless I make it something that's going to be super fun for us on stage, that's the way that we're going to save it. Yeah. So we just got to go, we have to give them unexpected. And I've had those moments where we're like, okay, it's a soft seater and we're sitting out behind stage, like back and we go, okay, we're going to start nice and slow. We'll do like a long doina and then we'll ease them into it and it'll be beautiful. And Marichka will sing and there'll be a beautiful mo Like we'll get it in. And then we get on stage and I, and I'm like, I look at the audience and I'm like, no way, I do not want to do that. <laughs> right into it, you know? Uh, you know, it, that's, we could talk about that whole part of ring leading, so to speak, for hours and how to, you know, you, but you're more exposed when you you are the type of band you are, which is you, you're, you're connecting with the audience much more than you're Billy Joel and you're up on stage and the place is sold out. It's Madison Square Garden. It doesn't matter. And you just play whatever set list you want. I mean, the people are going to react. But, you know, when you're tied to a set list, that's fine, too. And, and um, you know, but but when we have this collaborative thing with the audience that you have with Lemon Buck or we have with John Tom, we're playing for Tan Sazes or whatever, you know, that's it's a whole different challenge there, you know. Um, so it's it, it's a, that's interesting. Um, and yeah, it's a yeah. fully different thing. Like, yeah. you know, I have a, my other project, Balaclava Blues, is like, it's basically like it's an electronic music project with that's based around traditional Ukrainian polyphony. Mm -hmm. So, like, we use, we like sample and sing live all these traditional songs, but then it's like with, you know, EDM breaks and like hip hop music and a lot of, a lot of pre-recorded tracks and, and sort of like triggered stuff. And there it's definitely like, it's a set list. It's set. It's going to be the same. There's nothing that you can do except for that. Otherwise it's not going to work, especially mm. with like, we have video content that's synced to it and all that stuff. Uh -huh. And it's definitely a different thing, you know, like there's, and I wouldn't even say that it's better or worse. It's just different. You know, I love, I love performing with that project because, because it is so structured and refined and it's like, it's a composition. It's like watching a movie, you yeah. know, like you're not going to, even if you know that the movie is the same every time, there are still some movies that you want to watch over and over and over, you know, yeah, and it's because a, they're just yeah. great. And the way that it's executed or there's, or a symphony, you know, it's always going to be fair pretty much the same when you're listening to a certain big orchestra play uh you know an opus but like but it's still like it's still amazing it's an amazing piece of work so there is that but but folk music is not about that that's a completely different thing you know it's about that it has to be living it has to be breathing sometimes it's going to be faster sometimes slower sometimes Mm -hmm. The formal change, what comes before, what comes after is going to change. And, mm -hmm. you know, the best musicians are the ones that have that endless repertoire and can shift between stuff and, um, you know, and depending on who the players are, too. 
Yeah. So yeah, whoever's there and the mood and all that. Yeah, I mean it's a, it's definitely a different type of of at, atmosphere and challenge and a different stress. You know, when you don't have to make the set list, that's a whole different thing. Then, but then you're worrying about, oh my God, will people like this? Oh shoot, I can't shift out of this <laughs> piece we're on. We have 32 bars left. You know that kind of thing. So, um, I I I uh, we've been going for a while. But I, I still want about 10 minutes of your time. Can you give that to me? Yeah, man. Great. Yeah, for sure. All right. I'm here. I'm all yours. Oh, awesome. So I have... have we? How long have we been going already? Almost. I, I, can't, I think almost an hour and a half. Um, oh, man. We, yeah. We're, and we're just we starting out. We together more often. <laughs> yes. Well, I have... I have like these big kind of podcasty questions, you know, because this is a podcast long form. You've been great. And I, I, I want to ask some of these to you because I'm curious how you're going to react. The one I'd like to ask you uh, first is if you can pick to be one nationality, but not Ukrainian because you're already that, but and you can only uh-huh. play, you could only play that one nationality's music, which one would it be? Oh, man. Can't say Hungarian, by the way, because that's ass kissing. You can't say that. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a setup right there. No, it's um, not. It's not. It's not. <laughs> let me think. Um, geez, that's that. I don't know. That's such a difficult question. That's so tough. That's such a tough thing to say because there's so many different types of music and everything that I. Hmm. Oh man. Yeah, what I, would I, I you know I, what I, would I want to depending on my mood, I would say. And it's not about being that nationality, but it's more about the music. Like, I really love Bulgarian music. And I, yeah, re- and yeah. I really love uh, Serbian and Romanian. Like, those really, you know, I, I pick well, look, one of those like, three. Yeah, I mean, in terms... So, I recently found out that I'm also, that I have a little bit of Romanian in me. Nice. My brother did, like, yeah, we did, like, the spit test. And I found out that I'm, like... I'm 80% Ukrainian and 10% Romanian. Wow. Uh, and then like a mix of some other European wow. things and whatnot. But uh, but that, like definitely as a violinist, Romanian music, like Lotari music has always been the thing that I'm like totally enamored by. Mm-hmm. I don't even know. And we it's so funny because it's such a thing like marichka it doesn't speak to her at all and i'm always like let's play this like come on let's i learned this new song she's like oh this is so boring really <laughs> you know oh, yeah and i love it so much i love the vibe i love the like the modulations and like the just the complete unadulterated use of diminished chords everywhere mm-hmm. i just love it's so particular to that like to that region um to that part of the world and i just i love that style of playing but if i have to choose one that's like if i i can't be my own culture and i can't be my own instrument then that would then i think that then i would like the one that i i would i would go for like serbia and like Mm -hmm. a, a trumpet a truba oh I've like oh just like Serbian like trubaci music. It's that's been one that's always been that's always like spoke to my soul as well. Sounds like you want to become a member of a fanfare Chocerelia. Oh, Chocerelia for sure. Yeah. I mean, we played with those guys yeah. so many times, and they're they're so great. They're the best. They're you know Romanian Lotari but a brass band. Yeah. That's like the best of two worlds. Yes. <laughs> They've been, they were a huge influence on Lemon Bucket and our sound and our like the way that we sort of like approach performing too. Yeah, there are, there are a lot of similarities uh, that I can see. Um, you you've traveled and obviously collaborated a lot, and we haven't really talked about your collaborations, but you've traveled all over the world, and you guys have performed with the Lemon Bucket at least in Wom- at the WOMAD Festival in New Zealand and Pohoda, which is the very big festival in Slovakia, and obviously in Toronto as well, the Luminato Festival. So, uh, but I know you, you know, you spent a couple of years in Ukraine. Um, do you ever think about moving, moving, uh, back to Europe, uh, with, you know, Marichka being originally from there, has that ever, uh, you know, crossed your mind, uh, assuming you can move every musician from the lemon bucket there too. Is that something you guys have thought about? Every single day. Oh, snap. I had no idea you're going to say that. Tell me more dish. Go. Yeah, man. 
I, I definitely, I, my number one choice of place to live would be Ukraine. Um, I'm just, I'm, that's the, that's just the place for me. It's everything. I mean, it's everything for me. I, I, as crazy as it is, like my whole world as a musician and everything that I built all, and then also as a, in terms of my family, it's all there. You know, I experienced, yeah. uh, I first experienced like Balkan music and klezmer music and music from the Middle East and that all that I experienced first time in Ukraine. I first like sort of found myself as a person and who I wanted to be, the kind of person that I wanted to be. Um, when I was there, I obviously like met my wife there. I sort of found my, uh, what my sort of, you know, activist proclivities were leading towards when the revolution happened. Right. Um, you know, and then everything about everything about Ukraine and just in terms of the culture and the vibe and this sort of like, I just, I love it. That's, I, that's where I would go. And plus it's closer to all the other parts of the world that are, that I, that I love as well. Um, so, so it, that's it, where it would be for me. But yeah. I mean, the, the, the other, the flip side of it is just like, it's so fucked up there. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah. there's, you know, there's, you can't plan anything. And as much as, as much as like, uh, um, you know, uh, kind of like impulsive, um, person I am and, and, you know, have that kind of like artist mentality of like live every day. I'm definitely a planner too. Like I like, mm -hmm. I like being able to let's set goals and to see the path, look out into the field and decide which way I'm going to go. Mm -hmm. Um, and that can change, but you know, you, you still have sort of, that's, that's the sort of Canadian side of me, my Canadian upbringing. And so the fact that you can't do that, um, not only because of like the various social political, um, restrictions, but also then because of the like traumatic psychological effects on the entire population that, there's not a lot of people that think that way, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? So it's like, it's very difficult. Like even, for example, like to get a band like lemon bucket to work in Ukraine would be just impossible. Mm. It would just be impossible. It's like super hard to do even here, but like over there, it was, it was like, you know, just not a, not a possible thing. And that's not so much of a big issue for for me, but it is super, super important when it comes to our kids. Yeah. You know, and we've talked, we've had big conversations, um, with Matichka about it. And of course we've had like so many ups and downs of like, you know, why are we here? Or we want to go back. And, yeah. um, but then when you weigh it sort of against, what it, what the system provides and sort of like what opportunities are here um, for kids, then, mm. you know, it, it's a pretty clear decision, at least at this point in our lives. Yeah, I, I get it. This is the time when people have these conversations and the, these introspective kind of, you know, looks on where where they want to be or with, what, what would make sense. And, um, you know, I'm happy you're staying here. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah. Um, I have one last question for you, uh, Mark. And, 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 uh, that's a, here's a typical podcast, uh, uh, question is, you know, what, what would success look like to you and related to that when you're retired, which you mentioned before, you know, feet up, uh, looking at grandkids running around, you know, what, what would you want to say is the life you want, you, you lived? What legacy would you like to leave? Um, well, there's, there's, uh, that's, I definitely have a bunch of different answers for that one. Cause I think there's, there's a few different things like both like personally and professionally that, 
that I want to do and that are important to different extents. So I won't say them. This isn't in any particular order. These are just like some things. I'll start with like the superficial one. Like I'm definitely a musician, as you can tell, like with Lemon Bucket, where like I'm kind of a megalomaniac. Mm -hmm. And so I definitely want um, if I'm like taking a if I'm choosing a life of music, I definitely want my music to reach a wide audience. Um, and part of the reason for that is because like, I feel really confident in sort of my, my sort of moral and like political and social choices of like what kind of music I play, why I play that music and, and what I feel the the purpose is on a larger, on a sort of a wider scale. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I really want that to be a bigger part of the kind of culture um that is widespread you know that whole even when you think about i think about like the influence of tan's house you know like for me that sort of feeling and that what we were talking about earlier i want that to be a part of the the future of humanity period Mm -hmm. doesn't so much matter which what what culture it is but just that vibe of interacting with um with other humans on different levels and what we value um, in our day-to-day lives, I think is so, so important. And so, you know, as a musician, that's, that's the big part. Like I want to make sure that I have, I would feel success if I know that, that that sort of goal in me, if that reached a lot of people and actually made a cha- an impact Mm-hmm. on the people that, that my mu- music touched. Um, another one would be definitely like, I want to inspire next generation. Mm-hmm. That's a big thing. And that's why I've, I've been sort of like gravitating even towards like electronic music and mixing it with traditional and, and even with Lemon Bucket where it's like, it's a traditional band, but it's a really non-traditional way of presenting that um and kind of aggressive and like i say aggressive and vulgar way of of presenting that and that's i think just like speaking to youth and i've always had an interest in whether i was young or even now as i'm growing older like i just i i want to leave something find that instill that seed that is going to grow in someone in someone um you know, mm-hmm. in the same way that like musicians before me, whether they're older or not, like, you know, in the same way that like you as a violin player instilled something in me that has stayed with me and has made me want to become a better player, mm-hmm. you know, Great. and a better and a better community leader and things like that. Like that, that conversation that happens, whether it's in like one concert or one meeting or a week or a conversation, whatever it is that's that's definitely important to me so to know that you know that i've sort of influenced people that way um a next generation that's that would be success um to me for sure um and then obviously like like i definitely want my kids to be proud of me you know i definitely want my kids in the same way that i look at my parents and go man, they raised me, you know, they raised me right. They taught me the things that, um, you know, the, the types of like, we're so different in our career paths and in our like friend choices and everything, but they were always so supportive, um, and encouraging, um, and continue to be that and be close, um, and be that for, my grandkids as well. Like that's the kind, and I recognize that and I'm proud of that. And I, and that's something that I definitely want to be for my kids. Hmm. Well, your parents are professionals, like, or like, so not musicians, but they, they did other things like nine to five type yeah, of job. Yeah. No? Yeah. They always had music in their lives. Like mm-hmm. they both played piano, mm-hmm. um, like all the way through and then, and then, tried to get us into music early as well, but they neither, neither of them are musicians. My mom's an optometrist. 
um, and my dad's in the sort of banking world. Wow, quite different than yelling uh, of a out of a megaphone uh, in, in between the sousaphone <laughs> and the trumpet. Um, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Well, you know, there, there's so much uh, division in the world, Mark, and, you know, the unity that you're talking about, uh, I mean, especially right now, it's just heightened and it sucks, but the, the unity that you're talking about and what Lemon Bucket stands for and what you and your wife and your family and all your work and all the projects that you're doing, including Global Music Month and Urgent and everything else, you know, bring on the world, I think that's... Ex- it's, an, it's honorable, and it's exactly what the world needs. And I'd like to thank you, not just for doing all of that and for sharing your music, but sharing your time with us, because we're at an end here. Um, I'll, I'll give the floor over to you uh, to, to, to wrap it up with any words of wisdom or anything else you want to impart on the, the Tanz Haas Talk fans. Oh, what, I'll, I'll just say to be continued. I'm... I'm uh... I mean, I look forward to coming to another, to another dance house like when this is all over and we can all dance and 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 play again together. We'll get um, you. And I guess we'll until then, uh, yeah. Well, Mark, thanks again for your for your time and uh, on behalf of Mark Marchi and uh, Kalman Magyar and the Tanz Has Talk Show. Thank you very much for listening today. Make sure you subscribe on the podcast or on YouTube, and until next time, uh, have a great night or day.